Welcome back to In The Know. We are talking about fitness misconceptions and our guest expert today is Igor Klebanov. So we talked a little bit about dieting and why dieting or binge That's dieting right. is, is not good for you. Absolutely. And so any quick recommendations? Is it, you know, turn it into a lifestyle? Turn it into a lifestyle. Implement these habits very slowly, one at a time. Take one habit, do it for a month. Next month, stick, uh, to try the next habit. Next okay. month, stick to the next habit, step by step. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Should you be giving up anything? Um, I don't like to prescribe giving up. It's very difficult uh, from a psychological perspective to give up. Rather, I like to add things. Usually by adding healthy things, it pushes the unhealthy things out. Okay. Simple tricks. Good advice. Okay, so now we're moving on to self-assessments. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're just starting a fitness regime or you've you exercise already, which is yep. great. Uh, how do you do some self-assessments just mm -hmm. to make sure that you're in good shape or you're not going to get injured? Right. So here's something interesting. Even people who are in good shape are maybe predisposed to a high risk of injury just because of the specific exercises they do, the specific activities they do, uh, their, their jaws possibly mm -hmm. if they're at a desk all day. So this is even for fit people to figure out how at risk they are for injury. Okay. So here are five very simple tests that tell you how at risk you are for injury. Okay. One is a standing extension. Okay. A standing extension is just where you stand up, arch back as far as you can. Okay, and I think we have some pictures of these, so we'll try we and get them on the screen at the same time. So you're That's standing it. up and you're gonna arch your back. Okay. That's right. This is it. Now we're not looking so much for how far can you arch, we're just looking at how the end range looks. In other words, some people will arch back naturally, they'll ease into it and they'll ease out of it. Some people will arch, 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 and then they just get stuck. And you can't get back up. And they get, <laughs> that, that'd be bad, and they can't go any further. Um, so these are two different, uh, different issues. Uh, that, that, could, uh, sir, um, that could mean impingement in the, in the lower back, uh, or it could mean a bunch of other things, mm -hmm. tightness in the abdominal muscles and the hip flexors, but you have to break down this test to figure out exactly what's stopping you from going further back. Okay. That's one. The next one is a standing flexion. We have another picture of this one, okay. and that's simply where you put your feet together and try and touch the toes. Okay. Okay. Very common test, um, and it tests for a few things. One is your hamstring flexibility together with your lower back flexibility and your abdominal stability, your core stability. This is a big buzzword out there. Um, so this is testing, are you flexible enough to be able to function in life? Fairly simple as that. Right. Okay. The next test is a standing rotation. We do have another picture of this one. Okay. Simply, you rotate to one side as far as you can. So keep your feet together and just rotate as far as you can, ease out of it, rotate to the other side as far as you can, ease out of it. And what's the purpose of this? And again, we're not looking for range of motion. We're looking for, again, how the end range looks. Are you just stuck there or do you ease it into it and out of it? This is an actually, an, actually an asymmetrical movement, which means you have to compare sides. Mm -hmm. Can you go further to one side than the other? Interestingly enough, the biggest risk for injury is not tightness, it's actually asymmetry. So it's actually better to be tight on both sides mm -hmm. rather than be flexible on one side and tight on the other side. This way the body compensates uh, for the other side so you can, you're can you at a much higher risk for injury than if both sides are tight. So that's what we're looking for with this one. Okay. The next thing we're looking for um, is the shoulder mobility test. And again, we have a picture of this one. Put one hand um, through, uh, behind your back, one hand over top, and try and touch your hands. Okay. And repeat that on the other side as well. This what is if assisting. you can't touch your hands? Well. As long as you're symmetrically tight, I mean, you, you'd like to get symmetrically flexible, mm -hmm. but if you're only symmetrically tight, you're average. You're okay. not at any higher risk of injury than somebody who is asymmetrical. So if you can't touch your hands and it's symmetrically, mm -hmm. uh, it's symmetrically like that, you're fine. Okay. But if you can touch one hand on one side, the other hand you cannot touch, that's a problem and that should, should, should be addressed. Okay. So this is looking at two things. A, can you touch your hands? And what strategy do you use to touch your hands? Do you have flexible shoulders? or do you have a flexible mid-back, or do you have both? Some people can be bent over and they can still touch their, touch their hands behind their back. Some people have to arch their chest to be mm -hmm. able to do it. Some people can't or if do you have really, really long arms. Or if you have long <laughs> arms. Some people can't uh, touch their hands no matter what. Right. So that's, that's something that should be addressed. And some people are just so big and muscular, they, it's just a restriction, but it, it doesn't mean necessarily they're at a high risk for injury. Okay. Okay, that's the fourth test. And then the last test is the overhead deep squat. The overhead deep squat is, or at least should be in my mind, a biomarker of your musculoskeletal health. Um, what that means is assessing every single joint in the body in a very, very simple movement. Okay. All you do is you take like a Swiffer stick or a broomstick or something like that, put it over your head, and then squat down as deep as you can. You're looking for four things. Can you crack parallel? Can you get below parallel? Mm -hmm. Does the stick travel forward? Do you have to do this to get down? Do you have to rotate your feet out as you squat? And do you, um, 
do you shift to one side or the other as you go down or come up? Uh, so these are four things you look for that may be predisposing you to a, to a high risk of injury. Okay. Each little thing um, is a piece of the puzzle. Individually, they don't really mean, it, mean anything. You have to break down each one of these tests to see exactly why you didn't uh, perform the way you should. But together, they give you a fairly good picture of how you're doing in terms of your musculoskeletal health. Excellent. Thanks for that. We've got a call. We've got Jeannie on the line. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good, good. Thank Do you, you have a question for Igor? Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who has an office desk job, and she yep. always complains about uh, lower back pain and migraines. I think it's because uh, of the way her workstation is set up. Yep. So what would your opinion be? Okay, that's an excellent question, Janie. Uh, I often do uh, workplace wellness uh, programs for, uh, for clients. Uh, one of the things I do is ergonomic assessments, and yet I find that the simplest things actually have the greatest benefit. For example, you can raise your computer, you can lower your computer, you can buy special devices, special mice, special keyboards, stuff like that. And yet the simplest things are the ones that have the greatest effect. For example, one thing that easily fixes migraines is every 20 minutes or so, look away from the computer, look in inside the window, and look into the distance. So just look into the distance for about 10, 15 seconds and back to the screen. That's an easy, easy thing that relaxes the strain from your eyes and takes the pressure from, uh, away from your head so you, you relax that a little bit. Uh, the second thing that has the biggest effect is every 20, 30 minutes, just get up and walk around the room. Just one or two minutes and have a seat again. Now you can, uh, of course, do those, uh, those fancy ergonomics. You can do the fancy mouse, you can do the fancy keyboard. Uh, things like that, but again, the simplest things are correcting your mechanics, looking into the distance every once in a while, and simply just uh, just moving around the room every, every every few minutes or so. So this is the greatest thing that's going to have the biggest bang for your buck. Tell that to your friend. Excellent. Thanks for your question, Jeannie. And, and I'd say that's pretty common, especially with so many people. Oh yeah. You know, nine to five or nine to six or yeah. even longer in front of a computer. Yeah. You get tired. You get kind of the hunchback syndrome. Exactly. And, so where should your chair be in position to your mm -hmm. computer? So good question. Uh, you should be in a position where your knees are at 90 degrees, your hips are at 90 degrees, and your feet are resting on the ground. This is the least, um, least damaging position to your body, uh, but there is now a thought in the ergonomic field that the best posture is one that's constantly moving. So when your first grade teacher told you not to fidget, forget that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Igor. Don't go anywhere more in the know when we come back.